welcome. I'm Ross King, and this is Renaissance Discoveries, in which we look at innovations and inventions in Italy in the 13, 14, and 1500s. And in this video, we move to Venice, and we're going to look at one of the legacies of the Italian Renaissance that's less admirable and enviable than most of the innovations that I discuss in this series. Things such as the rediscovery of Plato, or the invention of perspective, or the practice of anatomy and the development of libraries, all of which had a positive impact on arts, culture, and society. But in this video, we're going to look at how Italian cities, first of all, Venice, dealt with their Jewish populations. In the 1400s, many cities and states across Italy found ways to control the lives and activities of the Jews who lived, usually only temporarily, in their midst. The Jewish populations of these cities were subject to various restrictions. For example, Jews could only practice certain jobs, such as money lending or pawn brokering. They could only stay in most cities for limited periods, usually only 14 days. They had to pay special taxes. They couldn't own real estate or have Christians as their servants, and they had to wear either badges or head coverings to identify them, usually yellow in color. But in 1516, Venice went beyond these measures. It segregated the Jews, making it compulsory for them to stay inside a specially designated gated and guarded area between dusk and dawn in order to minimize contact with and therefore prevent their supposed contamination of the Christians. I'm talking, of course, about the Venetian ghetto. And in this video, we're going to do, as always, a deep dive into history and culture to discover how things transpired, how it came to this. How did an entire religious and ethnic group get marginalized in this way, placed under a kind of house arrest? What were the terms and conditions of the residents? What was life like for them in the ghetto? And what was the legacy, finally, of the Venetian ghetto? The Venetian ghetto was founded during Holy Week in the year 1516. Now, 1516 was a very bad year for Venice. On March 26th of that year, a Venetian politician named Zaccaria Dolphine put forth a proposal that he said would solve the problems of Venice's many recent military setbacks. I'll come to these in a couple of minutes. These military setbacks were, in the first place, Dolphine and others believed, the fault of the Jews. But they're also the fault of the people of Venice for having allowed the Jews to live in Venice in the first place, thereby incurring the wrath of God who punished them, the Venetians, by having their enemies inflict defeats upon them. The ideal situation, some people believed, especially the preachers in Venice who denounced what they called the Jewish perfidy, would have been for the authorities to expel the Jews from Venice, as they had been expelled from Spain in 1492, from Sicily in 1493, from Lithuania in 1495, and from Portugal in 1497. But there was a problem. The Venetian treasury had been depleted by constant warfare. The Venetian Republic, therefore, needed the income paid to the state by the Jews. And the poor people in Venice also needed them because Jewish moneylenders and pawnbrokers could extend credit to them. Because Christians, of course, were not to loan money at interest. Lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. Luke 6.35. So what to do? Dolphine had a solution of how to keep the Jews in Venice, but also to keep them under control. He proposed that all of the Jews should be sent to a special island in Venice. He said that they should all be sent to live in a spot known as the Ghetto Nuovo, once used as the dumping ground for the waste from an adjacent and by then defunct iron foundry. Dolphine claimed this island was like a fortress, and he said it should be made even more like a fortress by being walled off, gated, the gates carefully guarded by Christians, and its perimeter patrolled at night by two canal boats, all of the expenses for which 
would be charged to the Jews. And here the Jews of Venice, some 700 households, would be confined from sunrise to sunset. The origins of the Jewish community in Venice are shrouded in the proverbial mists of time. There appear to have been some Jews in Venice in the 10th century, although only a tiny number. And in fact, the first reference to Jews in Venice is a prohibition from the 10th century. A decree of 960 AD forbade Venetian sailors from transporting Jews on board their vessels. However, by the second half of the 1200s, a small population of Jews lived on the Judeca, an island to the south of Venice. The name Judeca possibly makes reference to these Jewish inhabitants, although not everyone agrees that this is so. In any case, sometime around the end of the 13th century, the Jews were banished to Mestre on the mainland. The Jewish population in Venice itself remained extremely small throughout the 1300s because money lending was banned in the Venetian Republic in 1254, taking away one of the few occupations previously open to Jews because Jews were banned from the trade guilds and therefore couldn't work as artisans. However, Things changed in 1382 when the Venetians needed credit because of the expenses incurred in the costly and ruinous war against Genoa. And so the government issued a charter that invited moneylenders to enter the city. And it's at this point then that three Jewish moneylenders from Germany received permission to enter Venice, Simon, Jacob, and Solomon of Nuremberg. And they'd be followed by other Jews, all of whom were allowed to work in the ancient center of Venice, charging interest rates of 10 to 12%. In 1386, this small community asked for a stretch of land for use as a cemetery, and they were given land in San Nicolo de Lido, near the Benedictine monastery of San Nicolo. And this was the beginning of the ancient Jewish cemetery in Venice, in which the Jews from the lagoon communities would bury their dead for more than four centuries. And indeed, the cemetery is still there. And this is the oldest tomb, that of Shemuel ben Shimson, who died in 1389, the year the cemetery officially opened. And in fact, he was probably the first resident. Sadly, within a year of opening, the cemetery had to be protected by a high hedge to prevent vandalism of the tombs. So the desecration of Jewish graves is nothing new. In 1397, the charter allowing Jews into Venice expired and they were effectively expelled. Most of them went to live in Mestre from which they could commute. They could spend 15 days in Venice before they had to return to Mestre and then they couldn't go back to Venice for a fixed period of time, usually four months, although by the end of the 15th century, that was extended to a full year. I should point out that this is typical of the treatment of Jews in Europe. The Christians needed the financial services they offered, but they didn't want them. They didn't want any permanent settlement of Jews in their midst. So this kind of itinerant life was forced upon them. And when the Jews came to Venice from Mestre after 1397, they had to wear a distinguishing badge to mark them out as Jews a yellow circle whose size was the circumference that was stipulated of a loaf of bread and that was made from braided rope a finger width in thickness. And this, of course, is the rota or Jewish ring, which the Italian Jews called the shimano after the Hebrew word for sign, simun. These sort of distinguishing marks were used in many other cities following the Lateran Council of 1215, which stipulated that Jews and Muslims in Christian lands needed to be distinguished by their dress or other accessories. This was because of the fear of miscegenation, the mixing of and interbreeding between different racial, ethnic, religious types. So badges were therefore a familiar sight in Western Europe, marking out Jews and to a lesser extent, Muslims. This is an example courtesy of Michelangelo on the Sistine Chapel ceiling in which he shows one of the ancestors of Christ 
all of whom are Jewish, of course, wearing one. In Venice in the late 15th century, this circular badge would be changed to a hat, a yellow hat. And this practice of identifying Jews by means of a badge has, of course, a grim legacy in the 20th century. In 1509, a huge change took place in Jewish fortunes in Venice and in Venetian fortunes themselves, when war brought, as so often, upheavals and displacement. This war, known as the War of the League of Combre, was the result of Venice falling out with the Pope, Pope Julius II, the warrior Pope, not a guy you wanted to fall out with. The war was about territories and borders. Besides its overseas territories in the east, Venice also controlled or laid claim to cities on the Italian mainland, such as Bergamo and Padua. The problem in 1509 was that Venice also claimed certain cities, such as Faenza and Rimini, that the Pope thought belonged to the church. So Julius decided to take these back by force. As he told the Venetian envoy, I will never rest until you are brought down to be the poor fishermen that you once were. Julius therefore joined a coalition against the Venetians. And what a coalition it was. France, the Holy Roman Emperor, Spain, and not least Ferrara, because the latter, ruled by Alfonso d'Este, had the best artillery in Europe. The inevitable happened soon enough. On May the 14th, 1509, the Venetians were defeated in battle by the French at Agnadello, some 20 miles east of Milan, a devastating defeat that saw them surrender many of their mainland possessions, cities such as Bergamo, Brescia, Crema, Cremona, Padua, Verona, Vicenza, all gone, gobbled up by their various enemies. Many people from these lands fled the conquering armies and came to Venice as refugees, including many Jews, well, probably a few hundred families, including moneylenders from Mestre and Padua. They were entitled to enter Venice under the terms of a charter signed in 1503, which guaranteed them, i.e. the Jews, the right to come to Venice on special occasions such as times of war. This was not as kind-hearted on the part of the Venetians as it might sound, because there was a good deal of self-interest on the part of the Venetians who needed to protect the Jewish pawnbrokers who held their pledges. Over the next few years, the Jews spread themselves throughout the city, mixing therefore with the Christian community animosity towards them, towards these newcomers, was not long in coming. A Venetian nobleman noted in his diary that, quote, the Venetian people complained mightily about these Jews. He claimed that the Jews had joined the Germans in sacking houses on the mainland, in desecrating the host, urinating on tabernacles, and even in the age-old blood libel, murdering babies in cradles because they longed to dip their hands in and drink of innocent blood. Utter nonsense, of course, but dangerous nonsense. Seven months after Agnadello, in December 1509, the Venetians suffered another spectacular defeat, this time at the hands of Alfonso d'Este, whose lethal artillery destroyed Venetian warships on the Po at Polisella. If 1509 was an annus horribilis for the Venetians, the downward trend continued. Further defeats were inflicted over the next few years at Brescia, where they got trounced by the French again, and at La Motta, where they got owned by a numerically inferior army of Spaniards. Venice's proud and glorious history seemed to be unraveling before everyone's eyes. As one Venetian, Marino Sanuto, constantly noted in his diary during these years, the whole city was downcast. Everyone naturally began wondering who could have been to blame for these terrible military disasters. The 
The historian Robert Finlay has pointed out that the Venetians did not attribute their military setbacks merely to poor commanders, rubbish soldiers, and stupid tactics. Instead, they took a providential view of events. God himself was punishing them. As one Venetian man named Girolamo Priuli noted after the disaster of Agnadello, God has permitted and ordained the ruin of the Venetian Empire. He claimed that God was displeased with the Venetians because of such things as their sexual promiscuity, their ostentatious clothing, and their homosexuality, a fairly typical catalog of supposed sins that were unsightly in the eyes of God. But there was another factor, of course, and that was the presence of all the Jews in Venice. They were allowed in as refugees in 1509, and then allowed to stay because the government realized it could use their cash, both for its hard-pressed treasury and for the poor people of Venice. As Marino Senuto wrote, they are everywhere, and it's a terrible thing, and no one says anything, because due to the war, they are needed. That is, their money is needed. And so they do as they please. So there was much fretting about contact between Christians and Jews. The Jews in Venice, as we've seen, needed to wear yellow hats, but they were still free to live among the Christians. As a Venetian politician complained, they were in various houses and quarters of the city, giving a bad example to all Christians, the bad example being their Jewishness. The man who made this particular complaint, a politician named Giorgio Emo, had a solution to the problem a solution of how to keep the Jews in Venice, but also to keep them under control. In 1515, he proposed that all of the Jews should be sent to live on the Judeca. The Jewish leaders protested. They pointed out that there were mercenaries lodged on the Judeca, which would cause all sorts of personal security problems for them, uh, for any Jews placed in their midst. And the city fathers quickly dismissed the idea not least because, as Robert Finley writes, the political crisis seemed at that point in 1515 to have passed. And Venice looked, thanks to the death of King Louis XII of France, to be getting some of its domains back. But the idea of segregating the Jews came up exactly one year later, in March 1516, when things once again took a downward turn for the Venetians. And that's the moment when the politician Zachariah Dolphin proposed segregating the Jews not on the Judeca, but on the island where the iron foundry had been, the Ghetto Nuovo. It was called the New Foundry because it was put into use as a kind of rubbish heap for waste products from the adjacent old foundry, the Ghetto Vecchio, where cannonballs were made. This was not derelict waste ground. In 1434, when the foundry ceased operations, the land was sold, and by the early 1500s, it belonged to the Dabrolo family, who built some 25 houses on it, which they rented out to weavers and other small artisans. Dolphin's plan was very quickly enacted. Legislation came before the Venetian Senate three days later, on March 29, 1516. This legislation stated that the Jews had been allowed to come to live in Venice because of the urgent needs of the present times. But the main purpose of this concession was, the legislation said, to preserve the property of Christians, which was in their hands. It then went on to state that no God-fearing subject of our state would have wished them, after their arrival, to disperse throughout the city sharing houses with Christians and going wherever they choose by day and night, perpetrating all those misdemeanors and detestable and abominable acts which are generally known and shameful to describe with grave offense to the majesty of God. The upshot was that the senators voted overwhelmingly in favor, 134, 44 against, and eight abstentions. And so the Venetian ghetto came into existence. All Christians in the ghetto neighborhood, the weavers and other artisans, were obliged to quit their homes, which 
the owners could then rent out to the Jews with a 33% increase on the market value, 33% more than the weavers had been paying. And moreover, this increase was tax free. Jews incidentally could not purchase property in Venice, so they had to pay rent. And so here the Jews of Venice would live for almost 300 years in a ghetto, a word that the Venetians gave to the world. A brief note on the etymology of the word. The word ghetto was spelled in various ways in the course of the 16th century, G-H-E-T-T-O, G-H-E-T-O, G-E-T-T-O, and G-E-T-O. The word comes from the verb jetare, to pour or cast, a reference to the foundry for casting cannons that originally stood on the site. Later, it came to take on a different meaning for the Jews themselves, who referred to it as a get, which in Hebrew means a divorce or separation, usage which indicates how they felt divorced or separated from Christian society, an entire community living with a kind of perpetual curfew or almost under a kind of house arrest, guarded and under lock and key. However, it's important to note that Venice wasn't actually the first city to do this with its Jewish population, because compulsory and segregated Jewish quarters had previously been set up in various cities in Spain and in the Germanic lands, most notably the one in Frankfurt in 1462. This was the Judengasse, or Jewish street, or Jews' lane, a narrow gated street outside the city walls where Jews after 1462 were forced to live segregated from the Christians. What the Venetians gave to the world, therefore, was not a new concept so much as a name, ghetto, one that stuck, and the one, of course, subsequently would become notorious. So what was life like in the ghetto? Jews could come and go during the day, but at sunset they needed to be back inside the ghetto subject to a fine. There were certain exemptions, especially for doctors who needed to be at the bedside of their Christian patients. The gates were then opened in the morning at the ringing of the Marangona, the largest bell in St. Mark's, and the Jews would then go out into the city, to the Rialto, for example, to do business. When they left the ghetto, they needed, of course, to wear the special headgear, the yellow beretta, although doctors were sometimes given special permission to wear black hats. The original Jewish inhabitants of the ghetto were collectively referred to by the Venetian government as Tedeschi, or Germans, because most of them were of German descent, what today we call Ashkenazi Jews, because they were part of the diaspora out of the Rhineland. The word Ashkenaz is Hebrew for Germany. However, many of the ghetto Jews had actually been born in Italy or were descended from families who'd lived in Italy for many decades and generations. The terms of the charter to them allowed them to act as moneylenders, pawnbrokers, secondhand clothing dealers, and doctors. One of the few other things that they could do was to make veils and coifs. This is the Banco Rosso, the Red Bank, one of the pawn shops. Its name comes from the fact that customers received a red receipt when they left an object at the shop. And the term in banking, in the red, supposedly comes from this ancient Venetian pawn shop. None of the original Jews in the Venetian ghetto were merchants, and in fact, the Ashkenazi were not allowed by the Venetians to engage in trade. They couldn't buy and sell any new goods, either retail or wholesale, only second-hand goods. By the late 1530s, however, when Venice was at war with the Ottoman Turks, the authorities began to worry about the inroads their commercial rivals were making into trade. States such as Ferrara began offering liberal commercial privileges, such as tax exemptions and low customs duties, to Greeks, Turks, Slavs, and Levantines 
whether Christian or infidel, i.e. whether Christian, Jew, or Muslim. In 1540, the Venetian Senate therefore decreed that swift and vigorous measures were necessary to attract more merchants to Venice. And so they offered favorable terms to Jewish Levantine merchants, that is, Jews from the Eastern Mediterranean, from the Holy Land, Greece, and the lands of the Ottoman Empire. And some of them duly began arriving. These were merchants who dealt with a wide variety of products, leather, silk, and other textiles, alum, which was used for dyeing, wax, glassware, and so forth. However, very quickly, these merchants complained that the ghetto didn't have enough space for them and their merchandise. In 1541, therefore, an adjacent neighborhood just across the canal was therefore allotted to them, a clutch of buildings that belonged to a Venetian named Leonardo Minotto. Leonardo was forced to turf out his tenants, which presumably he was happy to do, because as in the original ghetto, Jewish tenants were forced to pay 33% more in rent, tax-free, of course. And so it was that in 1541, the ghetto vecchio, or old ghetto, was established. Confusingly, the ghetto vecchio, or old ghetto, was newer than the ghetto nuovo, or new ghetto. But these names, of course, went back to pre-Jewish times when the ghetto vecchio was used as a foundry and the ghetto nuovo as the place for its waste products. The ghetto vecchio was walled up to shut it off from the outside world. It consisted at first of only 20 houses, which tells us that the Levantine community was not a large one. The Levantine Jews of the ghetto vecchio were more affluent than their Ashkenazi neighbors due to the fact that they could engage in much more lucrative occupations than running pawn shops and making veils. An English visitor to Venice in about 1600 claimed that the Levantine Jews looked like goodly and proper men, and that the women were as beautiful as ever I saw, and so gorgeous in their apparel. Jewels, chains of gold, and rings adorned with precious stones that our English countesses would scarce exceed them. However, the Levantine Jews faced a different and extra kind of discrimination compared with the Ashkenazi. Because they came from or did business in the Ottoman lands, and in fact many were Ottoman subjects, they came under suspicion whenever Venice and the Sultan went to war with one another, and they were seen as agents of the Turks. They wore yellow turbans, which probably gave them an Islamic appearance. On one occasion, in March 1570, the entire Levantine community in Venice was arrested and imprisoned for an entire year, accused of being spies for the Turks. Their goods were confiscated by the state, and in 1571, an edict of expulsion was issued, one that included the Ashkenazi community as well, but it was never actually put into effect. The Jews in Venice needed places to worship, and five synagogues were eventually built in the ghetto, three in the ghetto nuovo and two in the ghetto vecchio. The first synagogue to be built was the Scola Grande Tedesca, the great German synagogue, which opened for the Ashkenazi community in 1528. It was known as a scola or school, a name derived from the Yiddish word shul, or school, the name the Ashkenazi Jews gave to the synagogue. But the name also probably referenced the squale, or Christian lay confraternities, which were also called schools. And this naming might have been to hide the fact that these were synagogues, because they were clandestine synagogues, which meant they were allowed on condition that from the outside, they didn't look like synagogues, which is actually quite easy because all of them were set up within already existing buildings. The different synagogues in Venice reflect the fact that the ghetto held Jews, as we've seen, of various different rites and communities. 
the Ashkenazi, the Levantine, and then ultimately the Sephardic Jews or Jews from the Iberian Peninsula. The largest of the synagogues was the Scola Spagnola. It was begun at some point in the second half of the 1500s to accommodate the community of Sephardic Jews whose recent ancestors had been expelled from Spain in 1492. Sephirat is the Hebrew word for the Iberian Peninsula, and hence the name by which we know them. Their synagogue, first built in the 16th century, was rebuilt in the middle of the 17th century by the great Baroque architect, Baldassar Longena, who also built some of Venice's most famous buildings, including palaces on the Grand Canal, such as Ca Pizarro and Ca Rezzonico, and the church of Santa Maria della Salute. By 1600, the population of the ghetto was around five to 6,000 people, although Venice itself had a population of well over 100,000, so the Jews were a small minority. However, with some 6,000 people, the ghetto was crowded, one result of which was that extra stories were added to the buildings, creating skyscrapers Venetian style. This was done by the Christian landlords, of course, because the Jews did not and could not own the properties. In 1630, the Levantine and Sephardic Jews who were in the ghetto Vecchio requested an enlargement, saying that affluent merchants would move to Venice if they could be accommodated better. Legislation passed in 1633 and the ghetto Nuovissimo, or newest ghetto, was born, the smallest of the three sections. By this time, there were other ghettos throughout Italy. In 1555, Pope Paul IV issued the bull cum nimis absurdum, since it is absurd. Paul was a severe, zealous, and brutal character. As a cardinal, Cardinal Carafa, he'd been instrumental in introducing the Roman Inquisition in 1542, and he even served as Inquisitor General. Even if my own father were a heretic, he supposedly said, I would gather the wood to burn him. In his bull, Paul deplored the fact that throughout Italy, the Jews were living side by side with Christians and even near their churches. So his decree compelled all Jews in Rome and throughout the papal states to live segregated from Christians in a designated area that was to have only a single entrance and exit. In other words, to set up something exactly like what they had in Venice. This led then over the course of the next century to the establishment of the ghettos in Rome in 1555, in Florence in 1570, Siena 1571, Verona 1602, Padua 1603, Mantua 1612, Ferrara 1624, and so on. Cum nimis absurdum is often seen as an indication of the hostility of the counter-reformation church toward the Jews, and indeed it often was. However, the historian Robert Bonfield has argued that the institution of ghettos did not necessarily imply a deterioration in the Jewish condition. He points out that the overall attitude towards the Jews was more tolerant and liberal during the period of the ghettos. Accusations of ritual murder disappeared, as did pogroms and expulsions. But as Bonfield also points out, what this really means is that the Christians could only accept the Jews if they were segregated and locked up each night behind walls and gates. And somehow that's just not a positive image of cordial ecumenical relations. The Venetian ghetto ended with the arrival of Napoleon in Italy in 1797. His soldiers burned the gates of the ghetto and the French principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity finally allowed Venice's Jews to be free and equal with the Christians. These days, Venice has a Jewish population of about 600, including some who still live in the ghetto, in the Casa de Riposo, 
a retirement home mainly for elderly Jews. When you next visit Venice, be sure to go to the ghetto where you can visit the Jewish Museum and the Banco Rosso, where a small exhibition is staged in one of the original pawn shops. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please watch more of my videos. You might be interested in the one I've done on the Kabbalah. Also, please subscribe to the channel so you never miss an episode. Please feel free to leave a thumbs up or a comment. And please, if you wish to know more about the good, the bad, and the ugly during this tempestuous period in history, I cannot recommend too highly a few of my various books on the subject available in your favorite bookshop.